And as the authors of this study say, these results contrast sharply with the reported observations of over 1,000 meditation-naive individuals tested previously. The point here is that this is apparently a strong top-down effect of attention on brain dynamics that has to do, again, with the internal self-generation of a particular um, attentional set. So dynamically, we could think of this in the following ways that a conscious mental state is embodied in a dynamic pattern of large-scale brain activity. It emerges from the local neural activities, but also globally shapes and constrains them. I'm moving quickly towards the end as fast as I can. So we have a, a complex top-down, bottom-up pattern. And then we could speculate that contemplative mental training may create new types of order parameters or large-scale collective variables, collective dynamical patterns, for the ways that neural activity is dynamically coordinated from moment to moment um, that we know is necessary as a, as a critical support for cognition. So the intentional enactment or volitional generation of meditative states may correspond to inducing these kinds of large-scale dynamical patterns in the brain. And um, just to visualize this kind of causation, we have then a complex, at any given moment of time in the brain, we have local interactions, but they're always within a global context that shapes and constrains those local interactions. And when we move from one state to another, like when you make the, um, the Necker cube flip, we have a state transition in which we have a new pattern of local and global activity. So coming towards the end now, I want to connect this back to what I said about intervention. Philosophers who talk about causation have proposed that we can think about causation in the following way to connect it with the idea of, of intervening. In this conceptualization, for something to be a cause of something else, for X to be a cause of Y, is for intervening on X to be a way of intervening on Y. By acting on X, you um, bring about Y. Interventions at a global level can bring about local effects, and interventions at a local level can bring about global effects. So if we think of causation this way, it allows us to say coherently that contemplative experience affects the brain by providing a distinct way of psychologically intervening, or mentally intervening, experientially intervening, on neurobiological processes at this global level of large-scale dynamical brain activity, which then has local consequences, consequences for quite specific things going on locally in the brain. So to come to an end, I want to go back to James. In the same chapter that I quoted at the beginning, James said, and this was actually at the end of the chapter when he's talking about um, the issue of free will, he says, the question of fact in the free will controversy relates solely to the amount of effort of attention which we can at any time put forth. Are the duration and intensity of this effort fixed functions of the object, or are they not? Well, I would submit, based on what I've um, presented to you today, that sustained attention, or sustained voluntary attention, is not a fixed function of the object. It's not stimulus driven from outside, for example. It's flexible and trainable, so it's not fixed. and it's an intrinsic function of mental activity and its embodiment in the brain, particularly when we look at this embodiment from a dynamical perspective. So it's not a function of the object. It's neither fixed nor a function of the object. It's flexible and trainable, and it's intrinsic um, to the uh, endogenous workings of the mind and brain. Free will, then, is not exemption from causes and conditions but is rather the flexible coordination of attention, intention, and emotion in skillful action. That's what it means to be free from a psychological and phenomenological um, perspective. And I will stop there, having gone over time. Thank you very much. Trying to